Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. No, this is not cabaret, it's Think About It, a podcast about the power of ideas and how language can change the world, with Uli Baer. What is the significance of the events in Charlottesville in the summer of 2017 for America? Today I'm being joined by John Mason, professor of history at the University of Virginia. He's an expert in African history and the history of photography, and was also a member of the commission in Charlottesville that studied what should be done with the monuments to the Confederacy. Welcome oh, to much. this podcast called Unmuted. I'm really happy I'm here with John Mason, professor of history at the University of Virginia. Thank you, John, for joining us today. I'm really happy to be here, and welcome to the University of Virginia. Thank you. It's a beautiful campus. It's stunning, beautiful summer day. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would be helpful. You're a historian. Your area is South African history, but also now African-American history and photography. And for our, the listeners to understand a bit what happened a year ago in Charlottesville, you were on a commission that the city had on race, memory, and monuments. Maybe talk a little bit about how that led you to where we are, and then we are here a year later trying to make sense of what happened. Sure. If you remember that the Unite the Right rally, this, this alt-right uh, bringing together of various ultra-right-wing white supremacist groups. They called themselves Unite the Right, and they came to Charlottesville last August 11th and 12th, caused the mayhem that people saw on their TV screens all over the country, and killed Heather Heyer, maimed over two dozen other people. There's a backstory to that. The ostensible purpose for that rally was to defend, in quotation marks, defend the statue of Robert E. Lee. The city had decided that the statue of Robert E. Lee, which is in a very prominent place right in downtown Charlottesville, in the most important park in the city, had decided that that statue had to be removed. The statue city council believed was a symbol of white supremacy. It was a symbol of the lost cause myth of the Civil War. It's that mythology of the Civil War that romanticizes the South, that takes slavery out of the Civil War equation. The statue of Robert E. Lee symbolizes that lost cause myth. And, and, they, also, and the city decided there was a process, to presumably. There, there so was. there was a debate and a yeah. process. And was that, and ultimately people there came is. out um, on the side to think this is not the right statue to have in this prominent park. That's right. I mean, it's a long backstory. And I was just talking about the city council's thinking, the city yeah. council's thinking that it was a symbol of the lost cause myth, mm -hmm. that it was also a symbol of the era in which it was built. It was erected at the height of Jim Crow segregation. It was a time when white supremacy had been reimposed in Virginia after the Civil War, after Reconstruction. White supremacy had to be reinvented after the end of slavery. That mission was complete at almost exactly the moment that those statues were erected. So the statue is also a symbol of that moment in Charlottesville's history. So city council, seeing the symbolism of these statues, decided to remove the statue of Robert E. Lee and put it in another place in the city. So the alt-right, the Unite the Right rally with these violent white supremacists, ostensible reason was to remove the statue. Now, so, city council did not arrive at that decision all on its own, right? So the story starts seven or eight years ago, that there has been an undercurrent in Charlottesville that those statues, I'm talking about two statues now, of Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, both of them in downtown parks, both of them in very prominent places. And remind our listeners, Stonewall Jackson is... Sure. So Robert E. Lee was, of course, the symbol of, course, of, yeah. the, of the Confederate cause, the commander of the Army of North, Northern Virginia, the most important army um, on, on the Confederate side. Stonewall Jackson was also a Confederate general, and um, 
one of those who's seen as one of the great military leaders of the Southern cause. He died during the war. Mm-hmm. He's seen by people who romanticize the Southern cause as gallant and dashing and a fallen hero. He died during the war. There's been an undercurrent in Charlottesville that those statues are inappropriate, that they send the wrong signal about what the city is, who we are. We are not a city anymore that embraces the romanticized vision of the South. Right, and these and statues you said were erected not in 1866, no, in the, or 1867, yeah. in the 1920s sure. they were put up? late teens, early 20s. Okay. Right, so absolutely they are not war memorials in the strictest sense, and I think they can very well be seen as both embodying this romantic myth, this re reimagining of Southern history that happened after the war, the Lost Cause, yeah. and also the period, right? They, they, they are erected in a particular period in history. So, there's been an undercurrent in Charlottesville <laughs> about those statues, and um, it finally came to a head in, um, in the spring of 2016, mm-hmm. and it came to the head because of the work of a high school student. Really? So, yeah, Zai Bryant. A high school student at uh, Charlottesville High School started a change.org online petition saying, take these statues out. And it caught fire. It really caught fire. And I think it caught fire at that particular moment because it's in the wake of Black Lives Matter. It is in a time when African American communities all over the country are mobilizing, especially young people, um, are mobilizing for change. And I think there was a zeitgeist that enabled this desire for the statues to be removed to actually catch on when it did. So Zai Bryant started that petition. It caught fire. A city council member, uh, Wes Bellamy, joined in and called a press conference down at the statue where they demanded that the statue be removed. And Wes Bellamy, the city council member, thought that he had the votes on city council to make it happen very quickly. It turns out that he did not. City Council wanted to move slowly, as elected politicians often want to do over controversial matters like this. So a City Council did what you would expect them to do. They appointed a committee. So it moved from an <laughs> online petition sure. by a student who mm-hmm. was studying his, his, his yeah, history. A high school student, right. And to, then to a City Council, they made it public, so the public is now paying mm-hmm. attention and people are now expressing their mm-hmm. opinions. Yeah. Okay. You know, the online petition, the press conference at the statue, mobilized a considerable amount of public pressure to do something about the statues. And as I said, Wes Bellamy, the city council member, thought he had the votes to get rid of the statues very, very quickly. It turns out the council didn't want to move that quickly, and council did what city councils and elected officials do. They appoint a committee to tell them what to do, and that committee was the Blue Ribbon Commission. So the Blue Ribbon Commission was designed to make recommendations about the fate of our Confederate memorials, Uh, and just as importantly, it was tasked with making recommendations for retelling the history of Charlottesville, to tell the history of Charlottesville publicly in a more inclusive and more complete way, and that was language that clearly indicated that African Americans, working people, women, Native Americans had been left out of the telling of the city of Charlottesville's history in public. So this is really a way of actually having Mm. a more honest, full accounting Mm. of history. Yeah. As a historian, you were on this commission, on on this Blue Ribbon Commission. I volunteered. I think there were 70 volunteers. City Council chose nine of us to serve on the commission, and we set to work. We set to work in several ways. We had a series of public hearings, about a dozen public hearings, where we heard from the public, heard subcommittee reports, we debated among ourselves. Three of those public hearings were just simply listening sessions, where people came in and they told us what they thought about these Confederate memorials. Even though an equal part of our task was to think about ways to tell this new and better public history of the city of Charlottesville 
almost no public attention was focused on that. The public attention was focused almost entirely on the statues. And uh, we heard from voices that fell into three basic groups. I mean, there were the neo-Confederates who believed that Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson are, in fact, heroic and noble men, and that they should be honored for what they did, that the Southern cause uh, had nothing to do with slavery, that the Southern cause was defense of the state, defense of family, dis defense of a people, and they wanted those statues untouched. Occasionally, they would come in dressed in Civil War era costume to reemphasize okay. the point. Not all of these people were overtly racist. Some of them certainly were. Not all of them were. And the rhetoric they used was never overtly racist in, um, in any of the public hearings. But there was considerable denial of what is a pretty clear history of what the Southern cause was all about. So politically they're saying it's about states' rights, and culturally they're saying it's about preserving their way of life, That's not right. letting the federal government dictate how to live. And That's slavery is dropped out of this conversation. Exactly. Okay. Yes. There was another group that saw the statues as artifacts of the City Beautiful movement. And the donor, Paul Goodloe McIntyre, certainly had in mind um, beautifying the city. Um, he was from Charlottesville. He had gone to the north to make pots of money and investment. And um, in his old age, comes back to Charlottesville and donates a number of things to the city of Charlottesville. Um, and the statues are among his gifts to the city. Uh, people who were defending the statues in this way saw the statues as part of the many gifts to the people of Charlottesville. Two parks, public library, uh, donations to the school system, donations to the University of Virginia, they see him as a great public philanthropist, and in some ways he was. But, you know, in, in all of his gifts, among the things he was doing was not simply beautifying the city or making it possible to build a magnificent uh, public library, but he was creating segregated public space. Okay. So McIntyre Park, which still bears his name, um, was for the white citizens of okay. Charlottesville. And what period and, is this roughly when uh, he's doing all this? This is the early this? 20th century. Okay. Well, I'll, at about the same time he's building statues. So he's building so, public spaces that are not really for the whole public. No, of course. They're, they're segregated. That um, He has a separate and unequal park called okay. Washington Park for okay. the colored, as the phrase was at the time, the word was at the time, for the colored citizens okay. of Charlottesville. His donations to the school system are donations to a segregated school system. Okay. The, um, the beautiful new public library is a segregated library. African Americans cannot use it. So that, yes, he was beautifying the city, but he's beautifying the city within a Jim Crow culture, which he did not challenge. When people pointed this out, so mm -hmm. I assume the people who were defending the beautify the mm -hmm. city movement didn't come in with that argument. Mm. When, so how did they respond when it was pointed out that he created segregated institutions or public spaces? They didn't address it. They just they, left they that just, out. Just, it seemed invisible right, or, they, they, or wasn't they, they, they had very little answer for it. And so rather than discuss this or debate this, they would simply leave it out of their presentation. Yes. But I think they represented a significant body of white public opinion in Charlottesville that is not neo-confederate and that is not wedded to white supremacy but nevertheless sees issues relating to the white supremacist message of these statues as not very important and off to the side. So that these statues are part of a larger public project to yeah. build institutions. The yeah. fact that those institutions mm -hmm in their time were segregated, it's not worth mentioning because we're looking at a holistic it's picture. Not, we can mention it, but it's not worth worrying about very not much. They're part, about. They're part okay. of the historical landscape of the city, and they should not be tampered with. We also heard that they're very beautiful statues. And okay. in fact, the statue of Stonewall Jackson is aesthetically quite good. I mean, it is a very beautiful equestrian statue. The statue of Robert E. Lee is rather stolid and plodding and thunks on the landscape. No, it's, it's really pretty ugly. Uh, 
Um, but we did hear the aesthetic argument, too. Okay. Um, and then it took longer for the critique to emerge. The first few hearings, most of the people who spoke in public were defending the statues. But as the public hearings progressed, and I need to say that these dozen or so public meetings that we had stretched over a seven-month period, so it was a long okay. process. Like a real exercise in American democracy. People from the public it, could, it were was. given a space to speak. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the third group emerged um, only late in the process, but they were making the critique, and they were critiquing these statues as in a variety of ways. They were critiquing them as embodying a lost cause myth of the Civil War. They were critiquing them as being emblematic of the Jim Crow segregation period in which they were constructed, which I have to remind everybody, your listeners and ourselves, that that was a period of racial terror, right? That was a period when lynching was still a commonplace event. In, um, in the American South. And so you're making a point, Jim Crow was not just people couldn't get out in right. a library or in a certain, on a bus, but there was terror, violence, and murder. Mm. Jim Crow was not just legalized segregation. Yes. It was that. It was segregated schools, segregated housing, segregated mm. public accommodations and transportation, but it was also racial terror, okay. right? So we have just opened a memorial museum to lynching victims in, in, in Montgomery, Alabama right. that has gotten quite a bit of press. And, you know, the Equal Justice Initiative, which is behind that memorial museum, counts, is it nearly 4,000, right. nearly 4,000 documented cases of lynchings, racial lynchings, right. but acknowledges that there are many others that are simply undocumented. So the true number is far in excess of 4,000. We don't know how many. Charlottesville had a lynching. It happened in 1898. That's within just over 20 years okay. earlier than the erection of those statues. So the idea of racial terror was part and parcel of the Charlottesville community. So as a historian, mm. those are, when you say it as a historical yeah. event, the lynching in 1898, yeah. was that known to people who grew up here and studied the history of Charlottesville? Was it known to everybody? Is it part of... It had historical awareness or personal stories. The memory of that lynching had faded in the current generation. Elder members of the community um, remember growing up hearing stories. Okay. And elder members of the community, some of whom lived in the vicinity of where the lynching occurred, remembered driving past it and people would say that was the tree. Okay. And point to the tree. More recently, that, that, that memory has faded, and it's been the research of a number of local historians that have raised that up again. Okay. And it's part in response to the Equal Justice Initiative. There will be a pilgrimage to Montgomery, Alabama later in the summer. We're talking in mid-June. And in July, there will be a pilgrimage down to the Memorial mm -hmm. Museum from Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. Uh, taking soil from the lynching site here to the museum where okay. it will be placed in a display with soil from other lynchings all over the country. So it was a period of racial terror. The Ku Klux Klan was also very active in Charlottesville from the early to the late 1920s. The Klan was organized in a moonlight ceremony at Thomas Jefferson's grave the event was on the front page of the Daily Paper, which went out of its way to point out that the people assembled at Thomas Jefferson's grave to reconstitute the Klan were some of the leading businessmen and professionals of the city. Okay. The Klan received enthusiastic, lavish coverage during the 1920s from the Daily Newspaper, often on the front page, and reported in ways that were glowing, reported in ways that spoke about it as if it were the Chamber of Commerce. As a regular so, civic organization. A regular civic organization. It announced its events. In the, in the, you know, if it had a speaker, it would buy an ad in the, in the paper. So it's like the Rotary say, Club or something like that. Absolutely or, it was. So legitimate, not despised, but it, sort of but publicly it, acknowledged. Oh. Hmm. And there's, you know, the Klan was by nature a secretive organization. And as far as we know, no documentary records from the Klan exist. There's some robes that the Historical Society owns that uh, 
that belong to clan members from the period, but we don't have we don't have lists. We don't have names. <laughs> we okay. don't have rosters of right. clan well, members. Minute, meeting, so, meeting minutes. Yeah. yeah, so it's impossible to say precisely who was in the yeah. clan and were they directly connected to the efforts to build these statues to Robert right. Ely and Stonewall Jackson. We don't know that. We do know that two days before the dedication ceremony of the Robert E. Lee statue, the Klan marched at night through the city of Charlottesville. Yeah, okay. hundreds of them. And they marched right to the foot of the black community that was called Vinegar Hill. So they marched through downtown and they march all the way up to the doorstep of Vinegar Hill. I mean, they are clearly doing this to send a message. And the timing, you know, just days before the unveiling of the Lee statue can't be accidental. Now, that summer, the uh, Klan continued to be quite active, burning crosses in the vicinity of Charlottesville, and even setting off bombs. It's all in the Daily Progress, the local newspaper, okay. um, that the Ku Klux Klan set off bombs, apparently in a sort of vacant rural area, but the newspaper noted that it was in the vicinity of an African-American church. Okay. They say a colored church okay. at the time. Okay. So, you know, the setting off of the bomb was not designed to kill or maim or destroy property. It was a demonstration of the capacity to do this thing, just as the burning of crosses are not about killing, maiming, or destroying property. They are, but they are a demonstration of our power and our ability to mess you up if you want to. Okay. So, yeah, no, it's, it's muscle flexing. Now, this is all happening at the very moment that this Robert E. Lee statue is being unveiled. It's, it's quite something. It really is. Um, so that's the context of yeah. what's happening so back then. Yeah. We, were do we, in the commission, had subcommittees. We had a historical subcommittee. We were learning all of this stuff. It's an um, amazing history. But other members of the community were also making these arguments that, no, we have to understand these the statues in sort of layered context and they are layered with different kinds of meanings and the meaning especially that white supremacist meaning can't be separated from these statues and uh, I think it's a compelling argument I think it's a tremendously compelling can argument. you break so, this down a little bit so you have the neo-confederates who are sure. saying this is about states rights yeah. and the way of life and not the federal government mm -hmm. messing with us. And you have the beautify Charlottesville mm -hmm. people. This is an aesthetic thing that's part of a larger project. The city shouldn't right. start ripping out certain parts to because it'll be an incomplete picture. Right. And then the last part, you're saying it, they're symbols of white supremacy. And in, in what specific sense is that? What, how does that play itself out today? So when you, what do they mean to people today then? So people who came sure. in and said they should be removed. Yeah, let me back up just a second and say that the group that was arguing they are symbols of white supremacy came from two clusters. One is a Black Lives Matter movement here in Charlottesville, yes. and another is white progressives, mostly organized around a group called Standing Up for Racial Justice Surge. Black Lives Matter and Surge were very important in bringing that perspective out into the public and articulating it from outside the commission. And okay. I think that was that was a really necessary move. Meaning so, they shape public opinion by informing people outside this formal channel of the commission. When the media, the television and newspaper, covered the commission hearings in, in quite significant detail, and so the public was seeing and hearing these debates. To hear the critique of the statues coming not just from within the commission, but from members of the public, I think that was very, very important okay. in terms of framing how this debate was happening. When we talk about layers of meaning, we're thinking about a lot of different things. You know, we're, we are talking about the way in which monuments speak non-verbally. Monuments speak without words. When we look at a statue of a man on a horse within this culture, we are predisposed to see that man as heroic mm -hmm. and valorous and worthy of emulation, right? You don't put men on horses who are bad guys, right? They are, they right. are good guys within our culture. Those statues also embody a myth of the lost cause because they are heroic. We see them, those men as honorable. 
And there is, in those statues visually, and in the little bit of text that surrounds them on their platforms, no mention of slavery, no mention of that moment in, that long moment in American history of untold human suffering. They are erected at a particular moment. They're in fact visual records of that particular moment, the photographs. But if you think of visually what it meant to have these, this unveiling of the Lee statue happening days after the march of the Ku Klux Klan through the city, what it means to have thousands of people in the park and surrounding the park, some of them dressed in replicas of Civil War uniforms. There's a message that's being told there too. There was also a convention that was held in Charlottesville surrounding the unveiling of the statues and there were two days of speeches and meetings and people talked very clearly about these statues telling the true history of the South. Okay, so it's really not ambiguous what they were no. put up for. Yeah. So. And if I can just interrupt myself and say that there's another layer of meaning that has been added, and that layer of meaning was added in August of last year, mm -hmm. when the alt-right assembled around these statues, the alt-right, the violent white supremacist, yes. saw those statues as embodying their ideals, their beliefs, as something that they wanted to defend. Now. You know, the defense of the statues was the ostensible purpose, and I have to keep using that word ostensible. Yeah. But symbolically, they are surrounding those statues because they see those statues as embodying something that they hold dear and precious. So alt-right is there, and I have to say that the death of Heather Heyer is also now inextricably attached to those statues, and especially to the statue of Robert E. Lee. You know, yes. Heather Heyer was a daughter of our area. You know, young people who knew her and the young people who were injured when the car that killed her drove into, the, when the man drove his car right. into, the car did nothing. When the man drove his car into the crowd, killing Heather Heyer and injuring two dozen others, those are mostly young people. Right. And, you know, they are going to be alive 60 years from now. Okay. And they will look at that statue and they will remember the time when their legs and ribs were broken and their friend Heather Heyer died. That's a layer of meaning that, that you know, it's cannot now. be washed off that statue. It's now there. Um, so, layers of meaning. Layers really, of so meaning. There's another layer now that we look at even yeah. like a year, year out that yeah. now we cannot dissociate these statues anymore from... Mm. This Unite the Right rally that yeah. tried to in, in also mm. infuse it with another layer of meaning, yeah. which is that this is 2017. Yeah. So. It's changed my mind about what to do with the statues. So, the well, Blue Ribbon Commission, uh, we actually made two recommendations to City Council about what to do with the statues. And we made two recommendations because we couldn't decide on one. We wanted a unanimous report. We didn't want anybody issuing a minority opinion. We wanted to present a unified public face to city council saying, here's what you need to do about these Confederate memorials, and by the way, pay equal attention to these other recommendations we're making about recrafting, retelling, re-envisioning the history of this city. And this commission yeah. was to inform city council with a, a panel of experts and citizens, including you, to yes. sort of make a recommendation. So they would have a space to say, we listen to everybody, That's we right. took everybody's opinion into consideration, mm -hmm. and you can now recommend how we should act. Right. We provided political cover. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so when we get back to the memorials, we made two recommendations. Um, we gave them A and B, not ranked at all, but this was to bring the committee together because this was the only issue over which the Blue Ribbon Commission divided, um, was over what to do with the statues. And so one recommendation was that the statue of Robert E. Lee should be removed from where it is in the park, and the park should be transformed, you know, it should be reimagined, re-landscaped, repurposed as something other than a memorial to Robert E. Lee and the causes that he embodies. 
Recommendation number two, as far as Robert E. Lee was concerned, was to um, transform the visual message, to open up that monument to other interpretations. Knowing and understanding that the statue speaks very, very powerfully, and it speaks without words, the statue is very large. When you walk up to it, you have to crane your neck. It has a literal monumentality yep. about it. We knew that to transform its message, we would have to radically alter it. Now, none of us are designers and none of us were artists, but we understood that it really made major transformations. You know, sort of take, for instance, you might start by taking it off its pedestal. Right. To lower it to, to, to the ground. Lower it to lower it to eye level so, so that you see it. it as a sculpture rather than as a monument, right? That you can yeah. see it perhaps as a work of art, but you also see it as something that's not towering above you and imposing itself on you, so it would be, but it can open it yeah. up to other kinds of interpretation. Like facing now, and now, engaging with history right. and not being... That's not all that you would do. Yes. And people thought about, okay, well, how can we visualize other aspects of the war in which he fought. Could we, for instance, bring slavery into it some way? Could we bring into it the 250 African American men from this region, from Charlottesville and Albemarle County, 250 men fought in the Union Army. They fought in what was called the U.S. Colored Troops. They fought against the South. Men from here, 250 of them. Okay, so that's right. an interesting part of history. Yes. So they could maybe be acknowledged in the sure. same space. So how could so you do that? So they're, they're also they're, native sons of this right. town. In Natives, a way. <laughs> absolutely. And have as much claim to uh, nativity yes. and as much claim yes. to the soil as anybody else. These are just some ideas, right? Okay. So, the, so the other, so as I was saying, one recommendation is to yank it out of the park. The other is to significantly and substantially transform it. And so we sent it off to council with these two recommendations and the other recommendations in our report. And council um, then voted to remove the statue. So they uh, took, so they took, they took they had the another they, alternative. They, they could have transformed right, the park. They, they took the removal. Yeah. And at the time, I, I voted in favor of both of those recommendations. And I certainly did not oppose council's recommendation or council's decision to remove the statue. But I favored the other. Um, I favored the transformation because I saw the statues in many ways, but one way I see them is as historical documents. So they're teachable they tell, moment. You can teach with them. They are documents in almost the same sense that a diary, a record of a parliamentary debate, that okay. the census records and tax records... These are documents from the past that historians use to help us understand how we got to where we are now, right? Okay. Um, no historian wants to destroy documents. And when I think in terms of public history, I would want documents readily available. I wouldn't want you to have to go to some warehouse to, to look at it, right? Not a public document. You know, that if we transformed it, I told myself, substantially and significantly yes. transformed this, we would open this up in public to new ways of seeing Charlottesville's history, new ways of understanding Charlottesville history, to be able to visualize all those layers of meaning that we've been talking about that that statue embodied. So okay. may I ask you something? Yeah. So you were a bit concerned that the other gesture would be too close to repressing or sort of leaving out yet another part to end up in the same spot to say we've moved it away you can't have access so this is a charge that people say when you remove right. a monument you're actually denying a history and you're saying it I, is part of history you just have to tell it in the correct way i don't think removing it is repressing and changing history okay it would be available for people to elsewhere see, just right. in a different spot you know look after all i mean if you want to read a newspaper from to go to the, that archive. very moment you have to go to a library to read right. it right? right you know so Not everywhere, right? yeah no but i did want this you know it's a public monument i wanted it to stay in public for the public right. to see and be able to interpret i thought okay so we can really we can visualize a different history we can tell a different history without words
Oh, yeah, I think it was a really great idea. But the commission the murder, went the other way. So they, yeah. the commission decided to... Well, and I've also money. changed my mind. And now, and so then the commission yeah. decided, and so August 11th... No, the commission was out of business. So, so we turned in our report, commission is disbanded, right. our, we, our charge um, is over. Once we turn in our yeah. report at the very beginning, 2018, yeah. and we're done. Yeah. But... For me, the murder of Heather Heyer changes yeah. my idea of that. That okay. now her blood is on that statue. And yeah. as I was saying earlier, I don't believe that that layer, this, this new layer of meaning can be removed. And this is now painful history that living people experienced, right? So that slavery was awful, right? It was, uh, it was an American Holocaust. Um, the era of Jim Crow was violent mm -hmm. and brutal, but none of us living, none of us walking past that statue personally experienced any of that. It's at a remove, but many, many people in Charlottesville among the living knew Heather Heyer, knew the people who were injured, were there on that day, or lived close enough by to have been traumatized by that day. I mean, I wasn't at the, you know, I was not at the rally, yeah. but I was in town, I lived nearby, and I could hear it, even if and I couldn't see it. And it's a small enough town. Yeah. It's, a, it's a community where people were aware and know. There was a collective trauma. Yes. Some people experienced it more intensely than others, but there was a real collective trauma in this city. Yes. And that's attached to that statue. And so I don't want people 50 years from now, and there will be many people alive 50 years from now, who were there at that day, yeah. who experienced that trauma. I don't want that statue in the middle of the city anymore. I just don't. Yeah. Um, now it has this layer of yeah. the, our contemporary history, yeah. which we share. Now, it's, it's unclear if the city will be allowed to remove the statue. There is a court fight right now going on where a law that the state legislature passed several years ago that was designed specifically to protect the Confederate memorials removes the power denies the city and municipalities, all cities and municipalities, local government agencies, denies them the power to tamper with these memorials at all. Okay. And it looks like at at least the first level, going through the court system, a judge will probably rule that the city has no power to either remove or even to change that statue, that the law forbids that. And I don't think either the city or the citizens of Charlottesville are prepared for that. I don't think they're ready for that moment where the court says, you can't do it. You, you can't remove it, you can't touch it. It's going to be there. Because now it's the history of Charlottesville, of this traumatic yeah. history yeah. and this shared trauma. That and I think there's a lot of people now that just want to get rid of the thing. You know, I mean, and, and we have nightmares of it being there and continuing to attract. Right. Not, you know, violent white supremacist, yes, but it also has attracted the Klan. The Klan didn't beat anybody up. They were here and their regalia. And then, you know, those preppy members of the alt-right with their tiki torches and right. khakis, you know, that, that as long as that statue is there, I think many people who opposed it, the removal of the statue earlier now say see the statue as something that's going to continue to draw so they now these people back in and a different want way. to get rid of it and so but if the court says no it's, i think that, i think that I, there's certainly going to be an emotional response from the citizens there's right? a bit of a um, bit of irony mm -hmm. that a court ruling would say you as a local community cannot decide how to mm. structure your public space when the whole argument initially mm. was it's our right to live the way we want to, right. you shouldn't have federal overreach, mm. it's not a federal law, but still there's a kind of yeah. a higher law that dictates a community how to treat its own mm. own public spaces. Yeah.
the the judge who's hearing the case uh, published a letter yesterday uh, sending it to the parties in the case where he said uh, city council members are potentially liable personally liable for any damages that are done to the statues and you know it's a threat basically it's a threat it's a threat that you know if you disobey this court order and you do anything to those statues you know I'll throw you in jail or I'll at least you know fine you enough that you'll be broke for the rest of your life I mean it's it's quite something that letter so what you're and, saying is that this fight this is about a year later so yeah. now we're in June and soon it'll be August and a year later but this is now still winding its way through the public with different mm. opinions yeah but you're saying this other it's, layers now cannot be removed well it's going to be late it's going the the issue with the statue isn't going away anytime soon, right? So whatever the court decides, there will be appeals. And it will be appealed all the way up to the Virginia Supreme Court and potentially to the United States Supreme Court. Who knows? But it's inconceivable to me <laughs> that the citizens of Charlottesville will rest easy yes. with a decision to allow that statue to remain untouched. And what happens, I don't know. I can't make any predictions at all. But I do know that there will be a very, very strong, you know, public response, an emotional and intellectual response right. to the idea of the statues remaining. When, when you gave me this kind of history earlier, sort of from the you know, 1860s, the Civil mm -hmm. War, to Jim Crow era, 1920s, and the mm -hmm. kind, of, a kind of reign of terror, really, mm -hmm. on the black community, and then saying connecting it to what's happening today, there are other people who have said this is not connected and removing any statues. This is un-American. We don't do this. <laughs> I've pointed out that yeah. actually Americans have moved many statues around the world of other regimes right away and yeah. have no problem with that. Mm. So, But I think this kind of historical scope that you present is something that people don't quite see. They see it as an isolated incident. Mm. This was a disturbance, a terrible event. And... I've noted and I've been struck and been somewhat confused when people say it was a tragic mm. occurrence. It was murdering somebody. That doesn't strike me as tragedy. Tragedy mm. is when there's fate and mm. something couldn't be stopped. But this was a deliberate attack. Mm. So the way you framed it is say this is not an entirely disconnected event out of nowhere. I don't think it's disconnected at all. I mean, I think that the alt-right is exactly correct to see the statue of Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson as embodying their values and their beliefs. But one of the things that I wanted to make clear, you know, speaking as the professional historian on the Blue Ribbon Commission, is that things that happened during the era of Jim Crow have consequences today. Yes. So, you know, one of the historical facts that we uncovered was the dim and, and this was hiding in plain sight. I mean, it didn't take much looking to discover this, but the demographic change in the city of Charlottesville. So at the time of the Civil War, most people in Charlottesville were African American, either slave or free. Most people, over 50%, well over 50%, something like 56% of the population were either enslaved African Americans or free African Americans. Well, that simple fact transforms the way that you understand the arrival of the Union Army in the city of Charlottesville. It did not signal defeat for most people. For most people, it signaled freedom and liberation. Interesting. You know? So more than it was an occasion of celebration and joy, not a, an occasion of sadness. So, but of course, we're primed to think, oh, the Union Army arrives and it's a sad day because the South is there. No, it's, it's a happy day. It's That's Freedom Day. It's so the, more than it's half the of jubilee. the citizen of this, more of than this half. town, right. they so think, think we're being liberated. So it's a yeah. liberating army mm. coming in. And the statue remembers right. defeat. This sure. is the end of the... So the enslaved population is roughly 51%. And then you add in the free African Americans, you get up into the high 50s in terms of the proportion of the population. But here's another demographic fact that today, Charlottesville's African American population is under 20% of the population, under 20%. So we've gone from 51% to under 20%. And so the question is, why did that happen? And you look at demographic change, you see that 
the big fall off in the African American population starts right around the 1890s. And right around the 1890s is when economic and frankly political and social opportunities for African Americans are really contracting here. You know, there was a period after the Civil War during Reconstruction where African American men exercised the vote. And African American men in coalition with Republican men, Republican, the party of Lincoln, with Republican men actually exercised significant political power. One of the projects of white Virginians in the era of Reconstruction was to take away those freedoms and those constitutional rights, and that was eventually done with the 1902, new, new constitution in 1902, state constitution, which imposed literacy and poll taxes, right? Literacy test for the franchise, a poll tax for the franchise, effectively disfranchising 90% of the African American population, right? So that was a long project. The same time that's happening, segregation is becoming much more rigid, discrimination and housing, employment, education is becoming much more rigid. And as the Reconstruction era, as the hopes and dreams of freedom evaporate, and this becomes a much more repressive society, African Americans begin to leave. And they're leaving because of the repression. They're leaving because of violence and the threat of violence in the form of lynching. And they're leaving for opportunity. That simply is not here. But there are and, three different reasons for leaving this. Sure. The, the, the deprivation of rights mm -hmm. that have been given for a while then violence and uh, intimidation and for opportunity. Sure. So the story is a complex one. It's not they just decided to move up north because they felt like living in New York. But right. they thought there isn't, we are being deprived of our basic rights sure. here. As, as you know, this is happening all over the South. Part of the great migration African Americans are going and they're being pushed by repression and violence and they're being pulled to the north by economic opportunity. Right, you know, that's right. then, so that's the fundamental way. But it, is, it, it drastically transforms the demographics of the city. And, you know, I could point to specific cases. I could point to, you know, prominent African Americans of, say, the 1920s, who store owners and school teachers, who had children who were quite accomplished managed to get college educations, went on to become doctors, lawyers, professors in historically black colleges and universities, but they all had their careers outside of Charlottesville. Interesting. Charlottesville, during the 1950s, during the Civil Rights era, the Charlottesville NAACP filed suit against the school board to integrate the schools because of here, as in all through the South, there was tremendous foot dragging and resistance to the Supreme Court's order that schools should be desegregated. So in the late 1950s, the NAACP filed suit. There were two prominent leaders of the NAACP at that period. They were both had independent incomes that allowed them to be protected from white economic retaliation. One owned a great deal of real estate and was an insurance agent. The other one was an undertaker. Very prominent members of the black community here, right at the top of the black community. They had tremendously gifted and accomplished children, all of whom had their careers outside the city of oh, Charlottesville. I mean, they don't live here. And you look at family after family after family where the children aren't here anymore. They're gone elsewhere. But that's a and, really interesting and, point that in mm, that 57% of the population during the Civil War experiences this as liberation. Sure. Now you have 150 years later, 20% of the population mm, is here. Under 20%. Under 20%. Mm -hmm. And you said there was this other group for racial justice, so there's also um, white people in Charlottesville yeah, who right. also are making similar claims that the sure. city is not acknowledging its own history. Well, no, the white progressive community here is really important in bringing these issues to the forefront, in part because the African-American community is so small, allies are, are absolutely necessary. But other things, Charlottesville remains a very segregated town. The, the segregation of the city of Charlottesville has its roots in the era of Jim Crow, when there were restricting housing covenants that uh, you know, prevented African Americans from buying in certain neighborhoods, redlining so African Americans couldn't get home loans. There are a variety of ways in which segregation that was created during the era of Jim Crow we still live with. 
There's also the over-policing of the African-American community for so long. You know, the role of the police was to control black people and to make sure black people didn't cause trouble for white people. And that culture of policing is so ingrained that in what thinks of itself as a liberal town, a town that has, for the last 30 years, had nothing but Democrats elected, with a few exceptions, almost entirely Democrats elected the city council, nevertheless, 85% of the people who were stopped for by the police, stop and frisk, minor traffic violations, are African Americans. This Out over, of fewer than 20%, uh, less than 20% of the population, yeah. and 84% are the ones pulled mm -hmm. over yep. in traffic stops. Okay. Sure. I mean, it's, it's a staggering figure. Mm -hmm. That has been once again public knowledge for the last twenty years, but does it change? No, we, you know, we, we've had um, black members of city council, a black city manager, our last police chief was African American, and this still does not change. Both structure like segregation that is set up during Jim Crow, and then cultures like the culture of policing that's yeah. set up during the Jim Crow. We're living with it. We are still living with it. I mean, that history has not gone away. Okay. It surrounds us. It defines us. It shapes the world in which we do, live. Do you see any, um, as difficult as that is, is there any positive outcome of these terrible events last summer? That there's more awareness or something, as a historian sure. especially. Like, do you think there's, or what should be the responses for people to think about this? I think there are a lot of positives. For one thing, we're talking about Charlottesville in ways we didn't talk about it before. Okay. That, Which was the second part of your recommendation, sure, also to rethink right. the history. We're talking about its history in ways that we didn't talk. Where we are making explicit the way that white supremacy and segregation were foundation on which the city was built during the era of slavery and after slavery as well. There is much more conversation about structures of inequality, economic and political structures of any, in the here and now, and you know, the emergence of a very strong progressive community, Black Lives Matter, this group surge, standing up for racial justice, Democratic Socialist of America. I think they're important. They're young, <laughs> and right. they've got energy, they they're have social motivated. Media. <laughs> they actually yeah. they know how yeah. to use <laughs> And I, I, you know, the, the election, last, um, last fall's election, Nakia Walker, who is a very progressive African-American woman associated with Black Lives Matter, was elected mayor of the city. You know, city council is strongly divided, and the mayor is actually, I have to say this, a weak mayor in Charlottesville. We have a city manager form of government, so the mayor actually is a cer mostly ceremonial position, chairs city council meetings, sets the agenda, but is not the kind of mayor that we associate with New York or Chicago. Right? Okay. Not that kind of yeah. not that kind of power. But nevertheless, her election to city council was a very important symbolic yeah. moment okay. of a new kind of politics yeah. entering into yeah. Charlottesville. So I don't know where the city goes from here. I do know there are a lot of people in Charlottesville who just wish we could erase the last year. You know that the violence started on August the 11th when hundreds of people with tiki torches marched through the campus of the University of Virginia. And then it was on the 12th of August last year that the violence happened. There are a lot of people in Charlottesville who just want to go back to August 10th. Can we just go back to August 10th? Can it just be that way? And of course we can't do that. Right. You know, we can't. But as a historian you would say, mm. let's think of what attitude we had on mm. August 10th. Mm. What surprised us or what yeah. didn't surprise us August right. 11th and 12th and now things make sense of that. I think that going back to August 10th, the people who want to do that are people who are thinking that Charlottesville is a great little town on August 10th. You know, Charlottesville had not become a hashtag. Charlottesville right. had not been a word that people recognize all over the globe. Charlottesville was not connected to violence and white supremacy. Can we just go back to that happy little town? And I think that one of the things that we saw through the Blue Ribbon Commission process is that it was far from a happy little town on October, on August the 10th, before yeah. the white supremacist arrived, that we had, we were a radically unequal town. And, you know, our job is not simply to think about how we overcome the violence of those two days, but also how do we address 
the inequalities that exist in our society now. But I like this point, actually, because Charlottesville, I think, becomes an emblem of what America has to reckon with. Mm. And it happens to be Jefferson's University and the birthplace of American democracy. And I think that none of this mm. is accidental, all these symbolic layers, right. Right? that people now look at Charlottesville and also think, this is a conversation for all of America. Sure. I think. Well, we're at the University of Virginia, so we have to talk about Thomas Jefferson. Right. On the night of October 11th, that's the night where hundreds of white supremacists with tiki torches marched through the grounds of the University of Virginia. They ended up at the statue of Thomas Jefferson that's right in front of the rotunda, the symbol of the University of Virginia, uh, part of the university that Thomas Jefferson, who was a great architect, part of it, he designed, right? He's the creator of the University of Virginia. And so the people with tiki torches were there and they surrounded the statue. But a number of UVA students and community members also were there to defend the statue of Thomas Jefferson from the white supremacists. Mm -hmm. So you had white supremacists who were gathering there and people who were in opposition to the white supremacists and despised everything the white supremacists stood for also encircling the statue, trying to defend it. So you have two competing claims over Thomas Jefferson. And they're both right. They're both right. They both have claims to Thomas Jefferson's legacy, right? Mm -hmm. So when the UVA students and community members who were there to oppose the white supremacists, they're thinking of the Thomas Jefferson who wrote the first draft of the Declaration of Independence, who said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, mm -hmm. that all men are endowed by their creator, we're certain unalienable, all men are created equal, all men are created equal, and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which a life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are glorious words. Those are emancipatory words. Those are right. liberating words. It's not an accident that African Americans from the early 19th century have used those words to hoist America on its own petard, right? right? So right. David Walker in the early 19th century, famously Frederick Douglass in the middle of, of the 19th century, Martin Luther King quoted those words all the time in his speeches because they are liberating words. This is also the Thomas Jefferson that wrote the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, a very important document, and that founded this great university and was a serious intellectual, mm -hmm. right, who really was engaged in the creation mm -hmm. of knowledge. And so that's that Thomas Jefferson, and that's worth defending. But there was also Thomas Jefferson, the slave owner. You know, the, the Thomas Jefferson, and whose position in society depended on the labor of his slaves, of enslaved people. This was the Thomas Jefferson who exploited the labor of his slaves just as much as anybody else did. This is the Thomas Jefferson that bought and sold slaves away from family members just as often as other slave owners did. This is the Thomas Jefferson who actually had his doubts that slavery was a good thing, that feared that slavery could tear the country apart, but was never able to divorce himself from the slave system, was never able to free the majority of his slaves. I mean, this is that Thomas Jefferson right. who's wedded to the system of racial slavery. He's also the man who, in the notes of his book, Notes on the State of Virginia, and in his other writing, is one of the godfathers of scientific racism. He doesn't invent it all by himself. I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's a long historical process to invent you know, 19th century so-called scientific racism. But he is one of the people who contributes to the stream of thought by writing about the inherent inferiority of people of African descent. You know, it's not accidental, it's not cultural, it is in their very mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. that they are intellectually inferior. Yeah, so there is a Thomas Jefferson that is also fully engaged mm -hmm. in the process of the creation of a white supremacist colonial state. So, so if the white supremacists want to go to a statue and honor him as one of their ancestors, 
they are absolutely correct to do it. Yeah. And if our UVA students and community members want to go there and honor him as also one of the ancestors of right. movements of human liberation, they are also absolutely right to be there. Right. And it's that contradiction that we just, you know, thinking now here, being a faculty member at the University of Virginia, I've been here over 20 years, this is a contradiction that I've learned to live with and it's useful for teaching, I have to say. No, it's, it's very and it's amazing how you present it because actually when you lay it out, it's, I think, clear which numbers mm. you like, but yeah. how you make it actually possible for yeah. the other side to say they can claim their Jefferson. Sure. It's as legitimate as the other claim. Mm. I, I want to thank you. Mm. John, it's really been the most informative conversation. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, and I hope to have you back on the podcast at some other time. Well, thank you. This was great. Thank you. Yeah.